I've been checking out a lot of controllers lately and the last one that I checked out was the Hunter controller from Retro Fighters. If you haven't seen that review, make sure to check it out. I really like this controller. This controller is more aimed at being nostalgic. What if you want all the bells and whistles on a controller? The King Kong 3 Max controller from Gully Kit is definitely on the top of the list. Full disclosure as well, this was sent to me by the company. This was sent by Gully Kit, but I paid for the shipping on it. And the grey one was sent over by the Run Snail store, which is an official reseller of Gully Kit products. Both these companies have not seen this review before it goes up, and of course all opinions are my own. I'm going to give you my honest thoughts to what I think about it. A long time ago on my channel, I reviewed the King Kong Pro 2 controller. This thing had a lot going for it, and out of every controller that I tried at the time, this thing was definitely near the top of the list, but I did have a few issues with the joysticks themselves. When the joystick rotated, you would feel a little notch. Since making that video though, I reached out to the official Goalie Kit store and they sent over some new caps and everything seems to be A-OK -okay ever since. This has still been a really good controller and I do really like it. These controllers still have a lot going for them. I do like the face buttons and I find it very comfortable to hold. One of the biggest negatives about it was the rubbery coating though as it attracted a lot of fingerprints. I actually gave one of these to a relative and when he was playing, one of his face buttons just fell out. These are easy to swap though and he's the only one that if known has had issues with that. I do think the black and the silver design looks absolutely fantastic on this controller. Of course one of the biggest faults of this controller was that it had pretty high input latency. But of course all that changes with the KK3 Max. The KK3 Max is set to have a 1000 Hz polling rate and it also comes with a 2.4 GHz USB dongle. This should make this controller very responsive. And if you have a lot of issues with input latency, I think you'll be pretty happy with this controller. But let's open these up and take a closer look at what's inside and how it performs. Both of them were sent from China directly and they took about two weeks to get to Canada with no import fees over four picks shipping. But let's take a closer look at their website to see what this controller is about. Looking at their website, let's look at some of the features of this controller. So one of the big standout features is that it has full Hall Effect joysticks and triggers. This should make this controller highly resistant to drift. We also have an upgraded rumble motor which should make rumble pretty decent. One of the other big features is of course the 1000 Hz polling rate. This is over wired and wireless which is really good to see. This controller also has a lot of features that we don't actually see on most controllers. So we can switch between analog and digital triggers. This also comes with the Xbox button layout, some metal paddles, and of course we get that hyperlink USB dongle. Unfortunately, because this controller just has so many features, I don't think I'm going to be able to cover them all in this review, but I'll try my best to cover the most notable ones. If you've never tried a controller with a thousand hertz polling rate, I gotta say it's something else entirely. This means that the controller is going to feel way more responsive in gaming. Something a lot of the community has been picking up on as well is that these are not actually switches under the face buttons. These are rubber membrane switches of a sort. These are still really nice face buttons and you can swap these out pretty easy. I've never really used these paddles on a controller before or on the ROG Ally or the Steam Deck for that matter, but I've heard they're pretty nice. You can always set them to something like reload, but I still think they're a nice feature to have. And I've never seen this on a controller before either, so their autopilot gaming allows you to record up to 10 minutes of footage. So if you were to do a level, and you wanted to redo that level over and over, you could record essentially the entire level. Then when it restarts, you could just have that macro replay, so it would replay through the entire level as many times as you wanted. We also have RGB on this model, and we did not have this on the King Kong Pro 2. We're looking at around 15 hours of gaming if you're using the lights, but if you shut those off, you can go up to 28. You can get this for around 107 Canadian, and I'll put the US price on the screen as well. You can also buy these directly on Amazon for $79.99. So you can actually get this on Amazon.ca too, and it goes for 100 Canadian. So $79.99 US or 100 Canadian. On the back of the box, it's going to tell you a little bit more about the controller itself. Let's see what we get inside. In the box we got two little joystick caps, 
We can use these if we're interested in getting a little bit more height out of the joysticks, but I think they're going to be okay as is. The bottom of the box, we have a little kit that comes with everything that we're going to need for the controller. This is going to include the ABXY Xbox style layout and the paddles themselves. There's also a couple different paddles we can use. These are solid metal and they feel very high quality. These are definitely not going to break anytime soon. I think it's really good that they include the Xbox style layout because I'm definitely not a fan of the Switch one and so many of these controllers come with the Switch layout by default. This is definitely great to see. Let's set this aside for now. And under that we have the controller itself. This comes in a nice plastic case with a couple of the shortcuts on the outside. We also get the same USB cable that they sent on the last model. This is a very flat USB cable. This is USB-C to USB-A. We also get a little sticker. A little manual telling us a little bit more about their other products. We also have a little documentation telling us to go update the firmware. And you definitely want to do this because this by default has some issues. At least my black one did, but I haven't updated this one yet. Out of every controller that I've used, this is something you definitely want to keep. The Gully Kit King Kong Pro 2 controller and this one specifically have so many features you're going to forget how to use them all. It shows you how to calibrate how to set the motion aim assist and all sorts of stuff. So definitely keep this because you're going to be referring to this probably pretty often until you get used to the controller. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at the controller itself. I really like this little case. I think this is nice for travel. And I gotta say, I love this color. This is very retro like. Out of both of these controllers, I'm definitely leaning more towards the gray one. Underneath the controller, we also have some more accessories. These are pretty hard to get out, but you can kind of see what these are already. This is the keycap puller, so if you want to switch this to the Xbox style layout, you're definitely going to need this. And under that, we have the hyperlink adapter. This is going to allow this controller to be connected wirelessly to our computer or any other device that supports it. This is also very low profile, and I'm glad that they have one like this. Compared to a standard USB dongle, this is pretty small. First things first, picking this controller up, you can tell, yeah, this thing feels very high quality. It also has a little bit of weight to it, and I actually really prefer that on a controller. It makes me feel like I'm using a quality product. The joysticks feel very smooth. That's because there's a steel anti-friction ring around them. The D-pad also feels excellent. This is actually probably the best D-pad I've seen. I really like the face buttons, and the lights came on as soon as I pressed them. That looks really nice. I do really appreciate gully kits, triggers, and bumpers. The nice thing over the previous model is the bumpers aren't too clicky on this. They're still clicky, but they're not obnoxiously loud like the King Kong Pro 2. The King Kong Pro 2 is pretty clicky, but these are much more usable, and the triggers feel very similar. In fact, a lot of the design is very reminiscent of the other controller. Even the triggers look very similar. If anything, the ones on the King Kong Pro 2 look a little bit more flared. They're still a little flared on the KK3 Max, but these feel a lot smoother for some reason too, and they don't bottom out like they do on the King Kong Pro 2. All the buttons on this are rubber membrane, so it's not very clicky, and I really like that. We also have the Home button, Settings button, we have the Start button, and the Select button. The one on the bottom middle is their Autopilot Gaming Mode, the center button is to adjust a lot of the controller itself. So if this was to turn on and we were to adjust it like this, we can of course adjust the RGB. There's a little bit of control over it. You can adjust the HD rumble by pressing this then down. And you can set the rumble modes by holding this and up. That's going to have three different modes. But yeah, overall first impressions. Wow, this thing is nice. If you're looking for a controller, I can already tell that this is going to blow away a lot of people's expectations. This does feel very similar to the King Kong Pro 2, but the King Kong Pro 2 feels a little lighter. I'll of course leave the weights to all these controllers on the screen so you can see the differences. The KK3 Max is definitely heavier. I do like a solid weight to my controllers and I'm quite happy with this. Button size on a controller can definitely make or break the experience. I like bigger face buttons as I find them more comfortable with gaming. I definitely think the KK3 Max has pretty decent sized face buttons. Let's take a closer look at this compared to some of these controllers. The face buttons on this come out to 10.2mm. 
the ones on the King Kong Pro 2 come out to 10.5 millimeters. The 8-bit Doe Ultimate Bluetooth comes to 9.8 millimeters. The Retro Fighters Hunter controller has face buttons that are 9.6 millimeters. And the X10 Mechanic Master is 10 millimeters. So around 10 millimeters is where I find the sweet spot for face buttons. The KK3 Max and the 8-bit Doe Ultimate Bluetooth are very similar in face button size. I don't really like them too much smaller than this. Joysticks are up next and I gotta say, wow, these joysticks are incredible. The joysticks are extremely smooth when you're using them and that's all largely in part due to the anti-friction ring. This is also a metal anti-friction ring so this is not going to wear out anytime soon. The RGB light around the opening also acts as an anti-friction ring and having both of these on there makes these joysticks extremely smooth. This is by far the smoothest joysticks that I've seen on a controller. The joysticks themselves are also quite decent for joystick height. These come out to 9.1 millimeters, which is right in the Goldilocks zone of 9 to 10 and a half. The Hunter controller is slightly taller at 9.9, .9, but these are both pretty decent. The 8-bit Doe Ultimate Bluetooth is a tad small at 8.2 millimeters. The King Kong Pro 2 controller is pretty much identical at 9 millimeters and the X10 Mechanic Master comes out to about 8.5 millimeters. The height on the joysticks with the KK3 Max is definitely really good. I don't really like the joystick height on the 8-bit Duo Ultimate Bluetooth. I wish this was a little bit taller. These other controllers are much better in that regard. Next, let's take a closer look at the D-pads themselves. This is a rubber membrane D-pad, but it's really nice. If you look really closely, there is some slight flare to the D-pad, this also helps you roll this a lot easier. It has a very, very slight pivot point in the center, but you can push it all the way down. So this is a more mushy D-pad than most, but I really do like this. The D-pad is also very soft to the touch, and it makes it very comfortable to use. It's also not hitting the controller itself, so even when I push it down, it's not rubbing against the outside, which is really good to see. And it's pretty quiet too, but we'll take a closer look at how these buttons and everything sounds in a little bit. This is the best D-pad that I have seen on a controller to date. At least in my opinion, I prefer a rubber membrane. But if you're looking for a switch-based D-pad, the X10 Mechanic Master has this one beat. Another thing about the D-pad that's really nice is the size of it itself. This is 22.5 millimeters, and this is a really good size for a D-pad. To put this into perspective, the one on the 8-bit Doe Ultimate Bluetooth is 23.6 millimeters. The King Kong Pro 2 controller is 22.6. The Retro Fighters Hunter controller is 22.2. This one also has a circular D-pad, so this looks very different. And the X10 Mechanic Master comes out to 22.4 millimeters. So out of every controller that I have here, I do really like this D-pad. It does feel very similar to the King Kong Pro 2. This requires more force to push it down. This one is easier to push down and it's a lot quieter. The 8-bit Doe Ultimate Bluetooth requires even more force to push it down and it's not very easy to roll. This is by far the mushiest of the D-pads that I own. The Retro Fighters Hunter controller also uses a rubber membrane D-pad. This also has a very hollow click to it. On the complete end of the scale, the X10 Mechanic Master has a very clicky D-pad. It is also very easy to roll. I'm pretty sure this is a dome-based D-pad. This also does require a little bit of force to push it down. But as for me, this is definitely on the top of the list. Now that we've talked a little bit more about this controller, let's hop into a sound test and I'll show you what everything on this controller sounds like. So from that test, you can tell this is a pretty quiet controller. If you're looking for a quieter controller, I think you're going to be really happy with the KK3 Max. Let's do a quick setup on the controller itself. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to swap out these face buttons. This is more likely going to be used with a Windows handheld or my PC. So I do want the Xbox style layout. Let me show you how easy it is to swap these. Let's grab those face buttons out of the box. I might try these paddles out down the road, but I'm not a really big fan of them. I think it's still nice that they include this, as this is something that's only found on premium controllers. The other thing that we're going to need is the keycap puller, and that's inside the case, so let's grab that too. 
to swap these out, use your keycap puller, put it around the face buttons, squeeze, and pull it right out. Then we can go ahead and just push the new one in the slot. That was really easy. And there you go. Now we have the Xbox style layout. Before we hook this up to the computer, we also need to look at the triggers in the bumpers. The bumpers are clicky, and these are really smooth. There's no texture on these, there's only texture on the bottom half of the trigger. If you remember from the King Kong Pro 2, all of the triggers and the bumpers themselves were completely smooth. This actually reminds me a lot of the Hunter controller. This one also has a very smooth bumper, and texture on the trigger itself. You can push the bumper down from any direction, including up here, and it's all very similar. The trigger also doesn't feel very good when I push here and I heard a little creak. If you push the trigger where it's supposed to, it feels very smooth and I don't hear any creaks. This is a very nice trigger. There's enough flare on it, and a good amount of travel. It's very comfortable to use, and it's also a good size. On the back of the controller, we have a little bit of texture on the grips. This is really nice. I like to see this texture on all controllers. We have a little switch here that swaps the trigger from analog to digital. If we swap the trigger to digital, it doesn't go down very far. But we can move that back to analog pretty easy and we get full range of motion again. I prefer the analog triggers, so I'm going to leave mine on this. There's also a little microphone at the bottom it looks like. And we have, of course, the paddles, which can easily be put in. I'm not going to put these in a mine. On the top of the controller, you can see the different mode switches. So you can press this once and it'll turn on. To swap the mode, all you have to do is double tap this and it'll move to the next one. Since I'm going to be using this mostly with a hyperlink adapter, I'm going to swap to that mode. You have the 2.4 GHz hyperlink adapter mode. You got Android or Bluetooth. You have the Windows X input mode and you have the switch mode. This is also the pairing button here, so if you want to pair it, all you have to do, turn it on, go to the Bluetooth mode, then just hold down the pairing button. This will initiate the search and you can connect it to your device. Let's finally go ahead and connect this to the computer. If you look on the top, it's still looking for the hyperlink adapter. To connect this, we're going to have to hold down the pairing button. There's a little button on the side of the hyperlink adapter, so we can go ahead and push that and hold that down for a couple seconds to enter the pairing mode. The controller is now working. I'm also not really detecting much input latency as this is likely using 500 or 1000 Hz. As soon as I press it, the skull jumps. This feels pretty decent, so I'm curious to see what kind of polling rate this is using by default. But before we look at the polling rate, let's take a quick look at some of the features of this controller now that we're in the game. To turn on the turbo mode, all you have to do is press the setting button in the center, then the button you want to turbo with. So I'm going to turbo with the X button as that's the attack for this game. Just press it once. So if we hold the button down, he's going to continuously attack. This is what I want for this game. If I let go, he immediately stops. But if you press the setting button and the X button again, so if I press it once, it's going to turn it on and it's going to keep doing that until I press the X button again and shut it off. If I press it one more time, the turbo mode has been disabled. To record with the APG function, hold the button down on the bottom for 3 seconds. Once it vibrates, do what you want to do, then press the APG button again to stop recording. You're going to feel it vibrate one more time. Then if you press the APG button once, it's going to repeat your macro up to one time. After it goes through that macro one time, it'll stop. But to continuously do what you recorded, all you have to do is just double tap that twice. This will continuously loop your recording that you've done until you press any button. As soon as I press A, it stops. So I think that's a pretty cool feature. Those are the two that I probably will use the most is the recording feature and of course the turbo function. And that's so much easier. If you want the switch layout on a PC title, that's pretty easy to do too. All you have to do, hold down the setting button and press the start button. This will swap the values of X and Y and A and B, even if you've swapped the actual buttons themselves. Now that we've looked at the controller a little bit, I want to see actually what this controller is capable of. Let's try a standard test with it to see what the latency looks like. I'm going to use XPad La to test the input latency and the responsiveness of the controller itself. So I've gone ahead and selected the controller in this test and I've also done 2000 samples. Let's just rotate the joystick and see what kind of input latency we're looking at.
Okay, this definitely surprised me. We're looking at a thousand hertz native polling rate with the 2.4 gigahertz adapter. These are by far the best results I have ever seen on a controller. Our latency on average was only 1.13 milliseconds. That's remarkable with only 0.4 milliseconds jitter. Out of every controller that I've tested, this definitely tops the list. I've never seen a controller with these kind of numbers just right out of the box. I gotta say, compared to the King Kong Pro 2, this is definitely blowing my expectations out of the water. One of the other things that we need to do before we consider this good and wrapped up, let's do a quick check on the circularity and the gamepad test as well. It is detecting the controller and that was instantaneous. And we also have to test the circularity as well. So let's do a quick test on that. Whoa. Let's try the left one. Wow. I've never seen joysticks this accurate before. Well, okay then. And the controller finished with 0% error rate, which is incredible. I also do want to test the average input latency over wired quick before we call this good and done. So let's use something that won't have any issues. I'm going to connect this to my computer with a Thunderbolt 3 cable from a van key. This is going to make sure that the controller is going to get all the bandwidth that it needs. So let's connect this and see what kind of results we get. I'm also assuming that we need to set this to the Windows mode, so let's go ahead and move that over. The results of this test should be pretty interesting. What we've effectively done is eliminate all the bottlenecks in the controller itself. Even with this connected over USB, we're getting an average polling rate of around 800 Hz. We're getting 80% stability. The average latency is a little bit better at 1.2 milliseconds with a jitter of only 0.42 milliseconds. Obviously, not many people are going to use this wired with a wireless adapter that good, but I did want to check this out just to see what kind of results we were looking at. One thing I do recommend doing before you run these tests or use the controller is upgrading the firmware. Let's go ahead and upgrade the firmware. I'm going to show you how to do that as well. The first thing that you want to do is to go to Google and search in KK3 Max firmware. This is going to pop up with the official site and the original firmware that you're going to need. Click on that first result and it's going to take us to the website where we can download it. Just to make sure that this is the latest version, what you want to do is go back to their download page, then scroll down and we're looking for the KK3 Max. So it looks like they're automatically going to show us the latest version. This is updated March 8th, which was yesterday as of recording this video, but I don't see any others here. Let's go ahead and click on that. Scroll down a little bit till you see the download. Here it's going to show us what the update added. So it looks like this latest version added a wireless wake function for the Steam Deck OLED. Let's go ahead and download that. We got to type in their little Kapacha code and just click OK and it'll download that update. Down here it's going to show us how to do the update. So. When you've connected it to your computer using the USB cable, press and hold the APG button for 4 seconds. Then press the A button to power it on. Now that the controller is powered off, all we have to do is plug in the USB cable first. Then hold down the APG button for about 4-5 to five seconds. While holding it, press the A button. And you're instantly going to see that a new drive has been connected. In the computer interface, you can confirm this. There's a 127 megabyte drive that's been connected. We need to go to that zip file that we downloaded. Then what we need to do is to drag this bin file into that drive itself. I'm just going to drag it right into the USB. As soon as I drag it in there, it's going to disconnect and start the upgrade process. The USB drive will disappear from the computer, indicating that the upgrade is finished. So after moving that over, the USB drive pretty much disappeared automatically. So now that I know, this upgrade is finished. You also want to recalibrate your controller after doing the upgrade. So just follow the instructions here and it should be pretty easy to do. Compared to the King Kong Pro 2, the KK3 Max is a huge leap forward. This controller has exceeded my expectations in every single regard. It's accurate, it's responsive, it's built very good. And so far, this is the best controller that I have ever tested. Both the black and the 16-bit colors look absolutely incredible. I think me personally, I'm just leaning a little bit more towards this gray, but both of these controllers look really good. I like the LED glow, and the battery life is excellent. I haven't had any issues with these two controllers over the past couple of weeks using them, and overall, I really do like it. 
If you're in the market for an end game controller, make sure to check out the KK3 Max. If you have any questions regarding this controller, make sure to ask in the comments below. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future videos. And as always, thanks for watching.